my name is Mike. I'm a program director uh, and a hiring director here. We'll talk a little bit more about kind of what that means and the collaboration and what Smithsonian Student Travel is. So over the next, I don't know, half hour or so, we'll talk in broad strokes, but we're also going to go deep into a couple of programs, Belize and our New York to Denmark program in particular, uh, hopefully answer some questions. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So if you have questions as we're going, put them right in that box there. My colleague Andrew is behind the scenes. He can answer them on chat. Some of them we might save to answer live uh, you know, for everybody at the end. But please ask questions. We want to get to know you. We want to make sure that these programs are the right fit. And hopefully, you know, uh, you decide that these are uh, exciting and interesting for your students this summer and uh, hope to have you with us. So again, thanks for joining. Thanks for taking the time out of your day to listen uh, a little bit more about these programs and this collaboration. Um, again, my name's Mike. I've got over 20 years of experience in experiential education, working with uh, Putney student travel that we'll talk about in a minute and Smithsonian. Uh, I was um, a student on a similar but different program when I was in high school and I fully understand the kind of transformational experience that these summer opportunities can have on a student traveling with it without their parents, without their siblings, without their friends from back home and how eye-opening uh, and really life-changing they can be. I'm a product of that so I love to chat uh, with families about that experience as well. Uh, so here is a little bit about the Smithsonian itself, uh, you know, based in Washington, D.C. This is what they call the castle. It's right on the National Mall down from the Washington Monument. Uh, and the Smithsonian has been an entity for 175 years. They are the world's largest education, museum, and research complex. So most of the museums and entities are in Washington, D.C., although they do have affiliate museums around the world, the National Zoo, all of those things. And their whole purpose is to increase and diffuse knowledge. So students are going to learn a lot on our programs in the summer, but they're not just, you know, for grades. They're not like school. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So they are experiential, they're hands-on uh, and fit so, you know, squarely within the mission of the Smithsonian to make better global citizens, uh, help make our students more aware of the world and the culture uh, around them in the places that we visit. Um, and so with those 175 years of history at the Smithsonian, uh, Putney Student Travel brings in their seven decades of experience running uh, student programs in the summer. So this is a true collaboration. I work for Putney Student Travel. My office is in the upper left-hand corner of this screen here, uh, right out this window. Um, we're located in Southern Vermont. We were started in 1951 by a husband and wife team, George and Kitty, uh, in the aftermath of World War II. Um, you know, educators who felt and fully understood uh, the need for students to get out into the world to better understand culture, language, history, people, place, cuisine, all of that kind of stuff in order to help, you know, in theory, prevent um, something like World War II from happening again. Um, and so, you know, the very first Putney Student Travel Program went to Italy, Switzerland, France, and Holland in 1951. Um, and we've been running that itinerary for the last 70 years. So Putney offers our own programs, the, the philosophy of travel, the administration of these programs, uh, the group dynamic, the emphasis, everything that we do, we bring to Smithsonian student travel programs as well. So the Smithsonian approached Putney a few years ago. We entered into this collaboration and I uh, hear from our offices in Vermont, work very closely with our colleagues in Washington, DC to, to create, run, um, and, and make these programs happen in the summer. And we'll talk a little bit about what makes Smithsonian student travel programs unique and sets them apart from what Putney does and what some other organizations out there do. Um, in the mid 80s, early 80s, uh, uh, George and Kitty's two sons, Pete and Jeff, took over the family business uh, from them and, and ran it for a number of years. And uh, we currently have Pete's two daughters, Liv and Becca, um, in the office as well as the third generation um, of the same family, you know, owning and operating Putney Student Travel. 
Um, so when you call us, you get to talk to us, you get to talk to the, the program directors themselves, ask questions, better understand who we are and what we do. Please call us, we love to chat. Um, and again, if you have questions right now, throw them into the Q&A box at the bottom there. So it's those 70 years of Putney experience, 175 years of Smithsonian experience that we bring uh, to these programs to offer really unique and exceptional, fun, experiential, educational, adventurous programs for, for high school students. So our programs um, range in length from 14 to 19 days. You can see highlighted in blue here, some of the destinations where we travel. We'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end. Our programs are open to students completing eighth through 12th grades. Um, every program is a little bit different on where the kind of average age falls, but it's usually right in that 15, 16 year old range. But we do get plenty of students completing eighth grade and plenty of students who are just graduating from high school going on to their college experience. And we find that, um, you know, with that age range on a program like this, that that gap doesn't really make that big of a difference because these are all like minded peers. You know, I think it takes a certain type of student. Uh, that wants to travel on a program like this in the summer uh, and focus in on certain themes. Our typical group size is about 16 to 22 students. You know, some programs could be 14, some could be 24, but that's the sweet spot. And all of our programs also have at least two, if not three, full-time group leaders that we'll talk about and the Smithsonian Student Travel Expert that joins for a portion of the itinerary as well. So here's an example uh, of just some of the types of people that lead these programs uh, in the summer. Uh, again, I mentioned I'm a hiring director here. I've been hiring staff for over a decade, interviewing, recruiting, finding the best of the best. Number one, they all love to work with students. You know, these are professionals in their field. The average age of our leaders is about 28, 29 years old. Uh, so these are people with life experience within the program themes, professional experience uh, in the places that we travel, language proficiency in the local languages. They really act as mentors, role models, uh, and cultural liaisons for the students that travel with us in the summer. We do not travel in a vacuum. It's not just our group in a, you know, in a sealed um, container for these programs. We're out and about and interacting with locals and the people and the places uh, and our leaders are really great at facilitating those things uh, for the students in the summer. You know, I'm still in touch with countless students that I've led on programs over the years. I've led more than 10 trips um, just through this organization alone, through Putney. Um, and so those kind of lifelong bonding, mentor, friend, facilitator, authority figure, all of those things are what all of these leaders bring to the table. Uh, I, you know, I'm looking at Jimena there in the upper left. She's coming back to lead a program with us in Costa Rica this summer. She was with us last year as well. Um, she has a background in marine science, conservation, sustainability. She's native fluent Spanish speaker and is just, you know, an amazing resource for the students. Um, you know, Pat McLaughlin in the bottom left there, longtime multi-year leader with us, PhD, um, from Drexel University, he worked on pan, panda research and reintegration, uh, Equatorial Guinea, um, working with um, a research station there, just all kinds of field-based uh, knowledge and research with the students. So all of these, Lisa, David, Julia, um, you know, love being with our students, what they do uh, and what they bring to the table is pretty incredible. So two to three leaders, uh, such as these on every program with the students. And in addition, we have Smithsonian student travel experts that join every program for a portion of the itinerary. So those leaders I mentioned on the last slide, they're with the students 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They're managing the health, the safety, the group dynamics. They're living in the accommodations. They're managing the meals. They're taking them on adventures. They're adding content. Um, from minute one until the kids are on the plane back home. These experts come into every program and join for about five days each to bring their own expertise to the program. Um, and just, you know, again, the, the students have meals together. They give formal talks in the evenings about the projects that they're working on that are relevant to the program, but they also have fun. They play games. They, they're integrated in the nightly meetings. There's tons of time for organic 
informal conversations as well. And it's just an outstanding uh, group of experts that come in to join our programs. Um, we'll talk about Gita uh, in a little bit because she'll be joining us on the New York to Denmark program. Same with Ed up here. Um, but for example, like Paul Glenshaw joined us last year on the DC to Houston program. He'll be back with us again this year. Um, you know, filmmaker, writer, all kinds of, you know, contributing editor to Air and Space Magazine. He really is an amazing resource for the students, a highlight of the program. Um, you know, ecologists, professors, art historians that'll join us in Italy, you know, for the Rome portion as we're walking through the Parthenon or the Colosseum to have an expert in archaeology joining the students to give context uh, and a deeper understanding. Just an amazing uh, opportunity for our students to have. And one of the things that really sets these programs apart, Smithsonian programs from other opportunities out there in the summer, um, you know, is just having this added bonus of these professionals with the, with the students. And again, they're there because they love working with this age group, sharing their knowledge and their passion, and hopefully, you know, igniting a spark uh, in a student, uh, you know, that's coming on these programs. And for the students that come, maybe some of them know, I'm really interested in marine conservation. I want to be a marine biologist and I want to do this program in Belize this summer. For some students, they don't really know what they want, but they're curious. And that's all that we ask for of our students is to bring a curiosity, a question, a passion, an interest, um, and let us do the rest and kind of help fan those flames while they're with us this summer. So let's talk a little specifically about two programs, uh, first New York and Denmark. I've done a number of these webinars this year. They're all up on the website. So we've gone in depth into Italy and Greece and DC to Houston, and we've interviewed Gita and there's, they're all up on the website. Uh, there's a better, you know, bigger overview webinar as well. Uh, so go check those out on our YouTube channel or on the website. Today, let's dive a little bit deeper into the New York and Denmark architecture and sustainable design program. Of course, this photo is taken in New York City at the Vessel uh, in Hudson Yards. Um, big, you know, new architectural um, development project there. It's getting a lot of attention. Definitely have opportunities for our students to, to join uh, or to visit that site for the days that they're in New York. So let's talk a little bit more here. Uh, let's see. So this program is going to probably be in the 14 to 16 student range, two leaders. Uh, and we do have experts joining both departures. We still have space in both departures for this program this summer, but things are filling fast. We can talk about that kind of application process towards the end. Um, but the program starts in New York City, and this is a great opportunity for students that are interested in sustainability, design, architecture, building, materials, uh, urban planning, anything like that these students are gonna find opportunities that appeal to them. So we stay on campus at Barnard College on the Upper West Side in the dorms there for the first three days of the program while we're in New York. Gita joins the, the trip, the first departure while in New York and the other expert actually joins the second departure in the, for the Copenhagen piece. But where we stay, great for the students, you know, college-like experience, the, the leaders are right on the dorms with them usually two students to a room with either a shared bathroom on the hall separated by gender, um, and just a great home base for us to use to explore uh, the city for those three days that we're there. So programs all start with kind of an in-depth orientation. So students all fly in, we give you parameters, land at the Newark airport between these hours, the leaders there to collect all the students as they come in from across the country, um, and that's really the start of the program is when we collect everybody at the airport and make our way up to Barnard. Once we've had a snack and everyone's kind of like, you know, shaking off the cobwebs from the flight, we do a really big uh, in-depth, what we call orientation to the program. And this is true for all of our trips where we sit down as a group and say, hey, we are together for the next, you know, 10, 14, 21 days. How are we going to, you know, how are we going to live? How are we going to work? How, what kind of community are we going to create within our group so that we can go out, um, you know, and support each other and have a good time um, and explore all of these themes that we're doing. So that's the kind of beginning of every program. And then we get out in the city. These are not classroom based programs. Um, you know, we are using the, 
the buildings, the environment, the city, the streets as our classroom. It's all experiential, hands-on, fun. So a brief overview, three days in New York. Then we fly as a group to Copenhagen with a day trip to Malmo, Sweden. Uh, then we're in Odense, in our house, in Billund, and then we return. So three days, four, three, and three. So we do move around, but it's enough time to really give us a chance to dive a little bit you know, deeper beneath the surface of these places and really kind of understand um, how they tick, how they were planned, and you know, an opportunity for a program like this to really compare like the layout, the design, uh, how people use public space in New York versus how they use it in a place like Copenhagen. So starting in New York, uh, the Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt Design Museum is based in New York. So that's gonna be one of our first stops for a day trip. Uh, you know, breakfast is usually taken in our accommodation, lunches and dinners are taken out and about on the town. Students have an opportunity to, you know, do a little bit of research and say, hey, let's check out this restaurant. Let's go to this food truck. Let's try these different things. We want our students to be involved in the program. It's a shared experience. It's not just our leaders prescribing to them, do this, do that check out this, check out that. We want our students to be able to say, hey, I have an interest in X, Y, or Z, and our leaders and our experts are able to, as much as they can, kind of cater to those interests as well. And so it is a shared experience as a group, and uh, we expect our students to really be active participants in the program. So visiting the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum, um, you know, talking about the history of urban spaces in New York, obviously have to visit Central Park, talk about its layout, its design, its history, um, the High Line, the Waterfront Park in Queens, visiting Hudson Yards where the vessel is, the Guggenheim, the Met. Um, we have planned meetings with an organization called uh, Material Connection, uh, which is a resource for furniture and arch architectural design. Uh, and they basically for the last 20 years have helped um, architects and designers find the right materials for their projects to help you know, fill certain design sustainability and usage needs. Uh, so our students get an opportunity to visit them, talk about what they do, how it's relevant to the rest of the program. So that's three full days there between you know, visiting all those things, eating all of the delicious food that New York has to offer, bonding as a group, and especially um, with Gita there, the expert, uh, really being able to, to form a really solid foundation of the program before we hop on a plane uh, and travel to Copenhagen. But before we do, here's a picture of last year's group. Nico is the leader there. He's a working architect. He took time out of his schedule last summer uh, to lead this program. Um, and there's Gita kind of walking down the, the street, showing students various architectural designs and buildings and layouts and asking all those kind of questions that pique their curiosity about you know, the why and the how of, of urban planning in a place like New York City. So from New York, again, we book the, the flight. You all travel together as a group with your leaders to Copenhagen. Once we land, you know, the first priority is to kind of shake off the jet lag, find some food, get checked into our accommodations. Again, we stay primarily in small locally run hostels and hotels. We're not staying in big name brands, places, excuse me. Um, but for the most part, we try to find accommodations that are going to support the local culture, um, be relevant to kind of the themes of the program, have good meeting space. You know, it could be two to four students to a room, again, with the shared bathroom. We rotate rooming assignments throughout the program. So all students have an opportunity to kind of room with everybody and make friends and connect in that way. Um, while in Copenhagen for those days, we have opportunities to take a bike tour around the city. Copenhagen is a very bike friendly place and you have opportunities to look at its urban design and layout compared to New York as it, as, as it you know, relates to transportation and commuting and getting around. Um, we have opportunity to visit the UN city, um, you know, all of the different buildings laid out in Copenhagen uh, relative to the United Nations. Uh, we go visit Coppin Hill, which is a clean energy plant, but it's designed in such a way that the top actually has a ski slope on it and like hiking and walking trails. So it's really integrated into the fabric of the city while also serving, you know, an energy purpose. So talking about 
how to integrate, you know, green usable public spaces into architecture and design. Uh, opportunity to visit uh, the Dance Ar Architecture Center. And then from Copenhagen, we take a day trip through a tunnel uh, under the water to Malmo, Sweden. The tunnel itself is a really impressive feat of engineering. And then Malmo as well is kind of on the cutting edge of sustainable design green spaces. Uh, so we have an opportunity to get into Sweden as well and kind of compare a third country uh, on that day trip. From Copenhagen, uh, we have private transportation on buses um, to our house in Odense. And in those places, opportunities to visit the Aarhus School of Architecture, maybe meet with some of the students or professors along the way, um, visit uh, Doc One, which is the best, recently both uh, voted the best public library in the world uh, for usability and architecture and design and integration with community. Um, we can go to the Idritz Park, which is a sports campus awarded the gold medal by the Olympic Committee. Again, out and about exploring, talking to locals, asking questions, meeting professionals along the way um, so that our students are really getting hands-on um, firsthand experience, not just seeing it you know, on a, on a whiteboard in a classroom, but feeling it firsthand. Um, from here, we have an opportunity to travel to Billund and visit a textile factory that was converted into a mixed use space for arts and culture and to look at repurposing of older buildings for you know, more up-to-date reasons. We stay close to the Lego headquarter and we do have an opportunity to visit Legoland, do a design build challenge at Lego. I think one of the earlier slides you saw our students built um, vessels that we launched on the river to see who could build the most, you know, see, stream-worthy vessel out of um, Lego. We visit the Science Museum. Very busy days, out and about as much as possible. Uh, and I mentioned before our expert. So Gita there will be joining in the New York portion of the first program. She's an adjunct professor of architecture and urban design at Columbia University. Uh, she has degrees from the School of Planning and Architecture in New Delhi. She has a PhD from the University of Tokyo, and she's really able to bring a global perspective to our students um, in the conversations and the talks that she gives. Uh, she's been a speaker at various women-centric design and architecture conferences. She's on the advisory board in New York City for the Waterfront Management Project, um, and she's co-founded, um, you know, various urban planning and design systems. And she was named one of the 100 most influential names in architecture in the world uh, a few years ago. So again, amazing opportunity for our students to be able to connect and, and form a, a rapport with her. Edward Becker on the right will be joining the other departure of the New York to Denmark program for the Copenhagen portion. He's an associate professor of architecture at Virginia Tech. He has a master's of architecture from Harvard a bachelor's from Cal Poly. He's on the Finnish Association of Architects. Uh, he founded a design and uh, sustainability consulting practice in Helsinki. He's lived and practiced architecture in Copenhagen itself. Um, and he comes from a deeply rooted background in professional ethics for sustainable design, livable cities, and general well-being. So that is a little bit deeper dive into the New York Denmark program, some of the activities that we do, the people that we meet with and work with along the way. Um, my colleague Chris actually coordinates this program throughout the year. He's actually in Denmark currently meeting with a lot of the people that our students get to meet with and setting up uh, a lot of the activities and places that we go and finalizing reservations and meals and all of that kind of stuff. So if you do have specific questions, uh, or want to talk to Chris directly about the program or anything like that, give us a call, send us an email. Again, space is kind of filling fast. So if you are interested, we would encourage you to, to submit an application to travel with us soon. As we're going here again, just to plug, if you have questions along the way, drop them into the Q&A at the bottom there. Andrew can answer them or we can answer them at the end. And now a country that's uh, pretty close to my heart. One of the first student programs I ever led was to Belize. It's probably the country, one of the countries where I spent the most time out of the US. Um, you know, Mayan history, archaeology, culture, 
uh, the second longest barrier reef in the world, second to the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, conservation focused, um, just an incredible country. Up until 1981, it was a British colony. And so English is spoken widely there, but it's tropical. Um, and they're very conservation focused as far as their land use goes. So just a great opportunity for students to see some sunshine, get underwater, get into the juggles, learn a lot about history, conservation, and culture. So this program, we start with three days uh, at Lam and I, and then two days at Monkey Bay, five days on Tobacco Key, five days in San Ignacio in the western part of the country, and then home. For this program, we do arrange a, a block of seats. We've contracted with an airline for a flight from Miami to Belize City and back. It's about two hours um, from Miami. And so you buy that ticket from us. You fly with the students. You fly with a leader. We give you the parameters for how and when to arrive to Miami before and after the program. You book your connecting travel. But as soon as you get to Miami, that's the start of your program when you meet your students and your leaders there and you all fly together to Belize. So first three days at Lamanai, which is a huge Mayan archeological site, um, kind of north of Belize city, um, you know, north, northern Belize. Um, so it dates back about 3000 years. It was once one of the largest cities of the Mayan civilization. So there's over 700 structures so far that they found and identified in the jungle, temples, ball courts, residences, um, streets, all kinds of things. And so our students get to spend the first three days really surrounded by Mayan history. A lot of the local guides that we work with uh, during this part of the program um, are Mayan descendants, grew up in the area, and again, are really great cultural liaisons for our students and the places that we, we visit. So again, the program will start with a pretty in-depth orientation, talk about the culture, talk about rules, talk about procedures, health and safety, but also how we are going to, you know, travel as a group for the next couple of weeks together. The majority of our students travel without knowing anybody ahead of time. And so uh, we put a pretty strong emphasis on that group dynamic, kind of doing those icebreakers and games that kids might find, students might find a little, you know, roll their eyes at, but they are super worthwhile. Um, and, you know, students have opportunities to meet kids from outside of their home, outside of their school, away from their families, make some friends with people that they might not normally be friends with at home, and really form some lifelong lasting relationships with their fellow travelers. From Lam and I, uh, we travel, um, well, actually, while we're at Lam and I, we have opportunities to travel by a river boat on the New River. We do an evening cruise while we're there to see nocturnal species of birds and reptiles uh, with local outfitters and guides. We go to the archaeological sites. Um, and then we transfer kind of to the middle savanna of the country to a place called Monkey Bay. It backs up to the Shibun River. They have hundreds of acres of conservation land. Um, and this is a place where we can work with their guides to monitor parrot nests, uh, where they like tag uh, bird species. We can go swimming or canoeing in the Sabun River. And it's also right across the street from the Belize Zoo, which is known as the biggest little zoo in the world. I've spent a lot of time here. Um, it's not like, you know, of the concrete zoos that we might kind of be familiar with in the U.S. It's actually built into the surrounding jungle and savanna. So it fully accurately mirrors native habitat most, if not all of the animals in the zoo are there because they are rehabbed or cannot be re-released into the wild. Um, so, you know, keel-billed toucans, scarlet macaws, of course, jaguars, panthers, jabiru storks, turtles, crocodile, you know, you name it, we have opportunities to, to meet with the zookeepers, maybe feed some animals, see the tapir, the national animal of Belize. Um, and really kind of get up close and personal with a lot of the wildlife um, that exists in this, you know, conserved country. From there, we hop on a boat and we go out to the barrier reef. We stay at Tobacco Key, which there is a research station out there on, again, the second largest barrier reef in the world. Um, we stay at a local lodge right on the water, sea breeze coming through at night, 
absolutely gorgeous and beautiful. Again, two to four students to a room. We take all of our meals there on site and then spend our days um, working with local conservationists, researchers out on the boats, going snorkeling uh, and getting up close and personal to all of this um, uh, marine ecosystem. You should be a pretty decent swimmer, but you don't necessarily need to have experience snorkeling ahead of time. We'll outfit you, we'll train you and teach you and get everybody in the water comfortably uh, to see some of these species. The great thing about the reef is that the coral grows in less than 30 feet of water in the photic zone. So you don't have to scuba dive. You don't have to be able to hold your breath to go down deep. Everything is you know, within those top 30 feet of the water uh, and it's a super productive marine ecosystem. Um, while we're out there, we do have an opportunity to do a night snorkel, uh, which is pretty unique to get in the ocean with flashlights after dark to see nocturnal species that come out. These are all run and guided by our local outfitters. We do a day trip over to Caribou Key, which is actually where the Smithsonian has their own research station. So we can see you know, what's going on there. We never know ahead of time what kind of projects are gonna be working on or who's gonna be on site. Um, so it's kind of exciting to see who's there and what projects they're working on, have opportunities for our students to ask questions, maybe help with the fish dissection, um, you know, all of that kind of stuff. We do go out to Glover's Reef for a snorkel, which is another atoll uh, part of the barrier reef. We do reef cleanups, beach cleanups, mangrove um, reintegration, all hands-on you know, work that is important for the, the ecosystem, but also that keeps our students active and really hands-on and integrated into the program. Here's a photo of our students. This is at one of the uh, marine reserves in Belize. It's one of the oldest, you know, they have some of the oldest marine reserves on this stretch of reef. Those are harmless nurse sharks. Um, and, you know, an opportunity, again, to snorkel with, with some wildlife. Um, turtles, rays, uh, big round rays, eagle rays, uh, eels, giant, you know, green moray eels, fish, uh, sea stars, sea cucumbers, all kinds of invertebrates, nudibranchs, uh, so many things. One of the most incredible places that I've ever snorkeled um, in the world. And from there, we head back to the mainland into the western part of the country to San Ignacio, which is just on the border of the Mountain Pine Ridge. It's a vast, vast area of conserved jungle habitat um, that also you know, houses Mayan sites like Caracol and Shunantanich right in San Ignacio, these big uh, temples, still the tallest structures in all of Belize uh, are still the Mayan uh, ruin the, the Mayan archaeological sites that are there, uh, still taller than any buildings in Belize City. It's pretty impressive. Um, so we have opportunities to take excursions into the mountain pine ridge. That cave in the lower right is the Rio Frio cave where a river has carved its way through the limestone. We get to explore that. There's some soaking pools. We go to an iguana sanctuary. We go to a howler monkey sanctuary. That's a howler monkey right there in that photo. We take lessons on traditional drumming. Um, again, all hands-on, visit the farmer's market, you know, buy some souvenirs to bring back home, get some Marie Sharps, uh, which is the local hot sauce brand that you'll have opportunities to try along with the, the rest of the cuisine. It's a lot of fresh fruit, vegetables, chicken, fish, rice and beans, fry cakes, um, you know, eggs, all of those kind of things that we'll have throughout the course of the program. So we do still have space in the first departure of the Belize program, and Dr. Uh, Nidhi Bathala will be joining us um, in Belize this summer. She's the Smithsonian student travel expert. Um, she's got 20 plus years of experience in higher education. She teaches ecology and environmental science. She's on the faculty of Rosemont College currently. She has degrees from Rutgers, Temple, Duke, and University of Georgia. She did her graduate studies in Costa Rica on sea turtle conservation. She did her postdoc work in Belize and Hawaii and the Galapagos. She's scuba certified, she's an author, and she runs um, STEM courses primarily for, for uh, women scientists as well. Um, incredible, very lucky to have her join the program this summer. See a couple of questions rolling in, keep them coming. We'll wrap things up here. Uh, thanks for sticking with me. The Smithsonian experience, 
innovative programming, Putney's uh, years of experience in the places that we travel, coupled with Smithsonian's reach around the world, means that the things that we do, the people that we meet, the places that we go are all super unique and innovative that you're not gonna get with other experiences out there this summer. Genuine cultural interaction. Again, we're not working in a bubble. We are working uh, you know, with the people in the places that we go, supporting local economy um, and getting firsthand experience, You know, interviewing uh, people, hearing from them. Um, and everything's hands-on. Yeah, you're gonna learn. These are educational programs. There's no doubt about it, but they're also super adventurous. We go zip lining, we go rafting, we go snorkeling, we go to the Blue Lagoon, uh, you know, in in Iceland. We do, we hike, you know, everything outdoorsy, active, fun, um, and engaging. But you're definitely gonna take something home with you. You know, you're gonna learn a lot on these programs, but you're gonna have a ton of fun while you're you're doing it. This is there's no grades, there's no tests. Um, this is like learning and fun for the sake of learning and fun, and it's going to be a life-changing experience for you. As I mentioned before, we put a pretty strong emphasis on the group dynamics uh, on our programs because we get students from all over the country. We get students from all 50 states. We get some international students, um, and we really work hard to form those kind of like friendships uh, and that support system on the program. I know a lot of my students I'm still in touch with or they create a WhatsApp group when the program's over and they're all still you know, visiting or checking in. I've had students that met on a program in Belize actually that I led that ended up rooming together in college. So uh, we put a big emphasis on that group dynamic. So again, what sets these apart, another reason along with the experts and the kind of uh, reach of the Smithsonian is the Learning Lab. This is an online digital resource where essentially the Smithsonian is digitizing all of their artifacts, their recordings, their letters, their photos, everything. And our students use that kind of as a basis to find a passion project, something that piques their interest, whether it's shark conservation or how to make fry jacks in Belize, um, or they want to, you know, work on redesigning, uh, you know, their public space park back in their home community. They can use the learning lab as a resource, um, you know, throughout the course of the program uh, to gain some context before the trip starts, but then also use that as a framework for sign up kind of these passion projects throughout the course of the program. And this is unique to the Smithsonian. Health and safety is our number one priority. We vet all of the outfitters that we work with. Um, we know where all the best clinics and doctors are, you know, travel. Kids get sick, you get a headache, you bump your head, whatever it is, it happens. We're super familiar with it. We are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week in our offices here. Myself and my colleagues answer the, it rings by our bed at 2 a.m. So if the leaders need us, if you need us as a parent, you can get in touch with us. We can get in touch with the leaders 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, so there's always open lines of communication. As far as communication goes, we do expect our students, you're welcome to bring a computer or a cell, cell phone on the program. But we set the expectation that there's very defined and appropriate times for a student to use their technology. We don't want them worried about their friends back home, what's going on on Snapchat, what the latest TikTok video is. We want them focused on their group, their leaders, and their experience. And so we do limit uh, the amount of time during a day or every two days when a student might be able to, to call home or check in. We definitely want to give them that, that opportunity, but we also want them to really be present and focus on the program at hand. All of our groups keep a blog throughout the summer, often written by students, photos posted by students. Um, and every two to three days, you can expect a blog post so that families, grandparents, aunts and uncles, friends can keep up to date on what the group is doing as a whole. And we do have an application process. So we just want to make sure that students are coming for the right reasons. We want an applicant statement, not a college essay, just a paragraph or two about why students are interested in and excited for this particular program. We also ask for the email addresses of two teachers. We send those teachers a digital reference form. They fill it out online. It comes right back to us. Um, and once the student submits those things, our admissions team takes a look and uh, makes a formal decision on acceptance. 
It's not like getting into college. We're not turning a ton of students away. We just want to make sure that they're excited about the program that they're going on, that they're coming for the right reasons, and that it's a good fit. If you have any questions about that, call us. We can talk to you about what the conditions are like, where we stay, what we do, is it a good fit for your students' interests, all of that. But again, just a little curiosity, a little interest. That's all we need um, from a student. They're going to integrate well into a small group of peers. They're going to learn a ton and have a lot of fun while they do it. So here's a full list of programs that we offer. Some of these are no longer available. They're either full um, or just aren't available anymore, but we do still have space in a number of these, Greece and Italy, Portugal and Spain, although this is the time of year when things are really filling fast. So as far as the application goes, you submit it through the website, you click apply now, you pick a program. Once you pick the program and the dates that work best for you, um, we uh, hold your space with a $700 deposit. $700 holds your spot in the program. Once your spot is held, that's when you get access to the applicant statement and the teacher references, um, and then the formal acceptance. Uh, full tuition at this time of year is due within five days of holding a spot on a program. Um, and if you don't get in for some reason, if you're not accepted, which I it would be hard to believe, we refund everything. But at this time of year, essentially, uh, full payment is due uh, just because we're, you know, making plans for the summer and, and all of that. So we would really encourage you to start those applications now, hold the spot soon to guarantee that you get your first choice um, of the summer. That's a lot. Thanks for your time. Thanks for sticking with us. Uh, if you do have any last questions, throw them into uh, the chat and I'm happy to answer them here live. If there are no questions, um, then we would encourage you to call and email info at smithsoniastudenttravel.org, 866-870-2350. Um, uh, we love to talk. I'm happy to talk to anybody about our programs. We hope to have you travel with us this summer. Um, let me just take one last look here and see if there's anything worth talking about. We talked about travel. Um, yeah, looks like we've answered most of anything. There is one about payment. We do take checks, we take credit cards, we take wire transfers. Those are the easiest ways to pay. Um, there was a question about, uh, do we know who the specific leaders are yet? In short, we do for many of our programs because I'm one of the hiring directors, but on June 1st, once you're accepted to a program, I should mention anybody that's accepted to a program, you have access to what we call a digital locker, which is an online resource uh, where we upload travel information, FAQs about the program, a more specific itinerary, bios for your experts, bios and headshots for your leaders. All of those things come in May and June. So once all of our leaders are hired, you will have an opportunity to learn more about them through their bios and their headshots uh, through your digital locker. Um, there's a question about if there's an activity that my child doesn't want to do, um, can they opt out? In short, yes, we're not going to force any student to do anything that they're not comfortable with. But with that said, we're also going to push them to try new things, get out of their comfort zone. You know, when you're out of your comfort zone, that's really when growth and learning happen. Uh, and our leaders are really great. And that group dynamic, that support system with the rest of the students um, you know, kids get nervous about snorkeling at night or going zip lining or, you know, going canoeing for the first time, but it's all part of the experience. So we at least want our students to give it a shot, give it a try. But again, we're not going to force a kid, a student to do something that they're just totally uncomfortable with. So hopefully that answers that question. And unless there's anything else at this point, I don't see... Anything else coming in? So again, we'll send the recording around. You can share it with your friends, watch it with your student, um, and give us a call. Start those applications soon. We hope to have you with us this summer. Thanks so much for your time, and I look forward to hearing from you.